this is the online journal club. This is our second event uh, for 2015-16 academic year. Uh, if I can get off my duff, we'll have another one, but um, it's been uh, difficult to find the time. But I'm joined today in my studio, <laughs> along with my head plant, uh, with, uh, by Michael Coyle, who's a uh, third year uh, fellow here at Tufts Medical Center. Uh, and we're going to be talking about uh, Chen et al., the phase two trial of, of tandem high-dose chemotherapy with autologous stem cell transplant, followed by reduced intensity allogeneic stem cell transplantation in patients with high-risk lymphoma. And hopefully I won't lose the connection as I, we don't totally freeze up, as I uh, display the slides here. All right, so I'm going to talk to you guys today about the uh, phase two trial of tandem high-dose chemotherapy with autologous stem cell transplant, followed by reduced intensity stem cell transplant for uh, patients with high-risk lymphoma. Um, so I'm going to kind of breeze through this background. As we all know, lymphoma has become a very treatable disease entity, though there is a lot of heterogeneity with um, more aggressive and uh, refractory disease, so many relapse or uh, just never respond. Um, uh, High-dose chemotherapy with autologous stem cell transplant is offered a means of uh, um, uh, delivering high doses of chemotherapy and myeloablative doses and allowing recovery, which uh, kills most of the uh, uh, chemosensitive disease. Although even with auto stem cell transplant, uh, disease relapse remains the chief cause of death. Um, uh, myeloablative allogeneic stem cell transplants are, can be considered, um, but uh, carry excessive non-relapse more toxicity as I'll kind of go through a little later here. Um, okay. uh, historically, combination chemotherapy uh, for induction treatment of, my, of lymphoma became uh, standard between the 1960s to 1980s with Hodgkin lymphoma, we had MOP and then progressing to ABVD and BIACOP. Uh, Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma have been uh, mostly with CHOP or CHOEP. Um, salvage therapy for relapsed lymphomas have consisted of DHAP and ICE regimens uh, as the most successful uh, forms. And then autologous stem cell transplant became a method to deliver high-dose chemotherapy and allow recovery. Um, the, the thing that really put autologous, the study that really put autologous stem cell transplant on the uh, uh, map for uh, those of relapse is the PARMA study, which was published in 1995 in the New England Journal. Um, uh, this uh, took patients who had relapsed with high-grade non-Hodgkin lymphoma um, and identified patients that were chemosensitive. So they had 109 patients that were chemosensitive uh, after DHAP salvage and randomize them to continuing the DHEP salvage for another two cycles versus uh, an auto stem cell transplant with um, BEAC conditioning. Um, as you see in the survival curves uh, up above, it's event-free survival and overall survival on the left and then the right. Um, those who on, went on to transplant uh, did significantly better than those who uh, remained on just DHEP therapy. Um, of note, they had three transplant-related mortality events and uh, 26 relapses of the 55 patients who were um, randomized to auto stem cell transplant. So even though they, uh, a lot of the patients, again, relapsed with just a single auto. Um, looking further at the, at the study group, they uh, um, identified an important signal and who would respond, uh, an important prognostic uh, factor and who would who would do well and who wouldn't. And that was uh, those who developed early relapse of disease. So those who developed the relapse less than 12 months from finishing their first treatment did considerably worse than uh, late relapse patients who had uh, greater than 12 months from their first, uh, as you see on the uh, survival curve on the right here. Um, this obviously was done before rituximab came into uh, came in as a factor, although uh, uh, further studies have been done 
chiefly the coral study, which uh, this is from, uh, which showed um, uh, took 396 diffuse large B cell lymphoma patients who were treated with either R ICE or R DHEP, uh, identifying 206 patients who uh, responded to uh, uh, the treatment, and those chemosensitive patients went on to receive a beam. Uh, conditioning with an auto stem cell transplant. And again, the factors that uh, affected response were uh, relapse less than 12 months versus greater than 12 months, also an IPI greater than 1 versus less than or equal to 1. And uh, prior rituximab versus no prior rituximab. Those who had received rituximab and relapse actually did much worse, and that's what these survival curves or uh, event-free survival curves are showing, uh, breaking it down by particularly by uh, less than 12 months and greater than 12 months uh, for relapse time. So um, if you relapsed less than 12 months and had been treated with prior rituximab, you did very, very poorly. Um, and again, showing uh, uh, it really doesn't, the rituximab really didn't change uh, uh, how people did and if they were primary refractory. So this is clearly one of the diseases that we're doing poorly in and uh, uh, part of the driving motivation for what we'll talk about a little, little beyond here. Um, so looking through uh, to other forms of lymphoma, uh, primary T peripheral T cell lymphomas, um, also uh, uh, you typically do poorly or less less well than uh, uh, diffuse large B-cell lymphomas and other B-cell lymphomas. Um, and uh, this this study from uh, Demore et al. in uh, 2012 uh, looked at um, auto stem cell transplant in 115 patients. Uh, ex they excluded out positive um, ALCL patients um, and took took these 115 patients to auto transplant after CHOEP induction. Uh, there was an early failure rate of about 26%, which you can see on the uh, overall and progression-free survival curves above, uh, and uh, treatment-related mortality of about 4%. Uh, the five-year overall survival was uh, not ideal at 51%, and uh, uh, progression-free survival uh, was at 44%. In the subtype analysis, out negative patients did the best uh, overall, but clearly there's remains a need for peripheral T cell lymphoma patients as well. Um, looking at uh, mantle cell, another uh, difficult to treat lymphoma, um, a couple of trials have been done. The Nordic uh, MCL trial. Uh, uh, analysis of uh, uh, auto transplant. Uh, the median event free survival was about 7.4 years, and actually, median overall survival was not reached uh, with a uh, fairly acceptable 7.5% non relapse mortality after, uh, after transplant. Um, the multivariate analysis for looking for risk of relapse uh, identified the MIPI and uh, KI67 as the two uh, uh, significant factors, and the, actually in this study combined them to form a biological MIPI or MIPI-B score, which uh, you can look up at that source. Um, and Tuzo et al. did a retrospective analysis of 500 patients with uh, mantle cell who had received an auto stem cell transplant and uh, a three-year PFS of 63.5% with a three-year overall survival of about 79.5%. Um, the uh, multivariate analysis uh, found significance at age at dividing at 50, uh, disease status uh, when they received their transplant, uh, dividing by complete response versus other response, and uh, the use of rituximab as significant. Um, so, in an effort to try and, and do other other uh, means of treatment for these patients, uh, some people have looked at myeloablative, uh, allo stem cell transplants. What I really want you to focus on is the uh, in this 
chart here, I hope it comes through okay, is the uh, TRN, which uh, um, uh, is remarkably high uh, for any of the myeloablative. Uh, this is often because these patients have been heavily pretreated with multiple lines of therapy. Uh, a lot of them are older as well, and so uh, uh, difficult to uh, uh, tolerate the toxicity of an allogeneic myeloablative conditioning. Um, the, so uh, uh, because of all this, uh, a lot of people have looked at reduced intensity. Uh, and this is just some diffuse large B cell of this, this chart, these studies. But um, if you go to the next slide, it, I do mention within the other uh, lymphoma subtypes, uh, T cell lymphoma, uh, there's been some small series of patients going on to uh, uh, myeloablative aloes. Um, 18, an 18 patient series had a three year overall survival of only 39%, a three year PFS of 33%, and a non relapse mortality of about 39%. So, uh, a pretty high non relapse for not a lot of, of gain. Uh, uh, doing a reduced intensity allo with 17 patients, Corradini et al., found a, a much higher three year overall survival. Uh, with a, a much more tolerable non-relapse mortality, although um, uh, relapses, relapses did happen more tend to happen more frequently with the reduced intensity approach. Um, similar results are seen in mantle cell, a 16 patient series from 1998, uh, 14 of whom had a myeloablative uh, um, conditioning, and there were six non-relapse mortalities uh, during that. And uh, um, again, with Hodgkin lymphoma, myeloablative conditioning has been associated with high non-relapse mortality and still getting high, re high rates of relapse. Um, there is concern with just trying an upfront reduced intensity ELO alone. Um, looking at CIBMTR data uh, in follicular lymphoma and diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, two different studies have found that uh, uh, while you get less uh, less uh, non-relapse mortality with the reduced intensity, you get less, uh, you get more relapse with uh, a reduced intensity approach. And actually the PFS and overall survival was less for the reduced intensity approach in follicular lymphoma. Um, so, that, so that's kind of spurred the uh, thinking and, and rationale to uh, Proceed to uh, what's discussed. We'll discuss in this paper um, using a, uh, a tandem approach, where you get the uh, cytotoxic effect of the um, auto transplant up front, with, and then the reduced intensity uh, allo for those who can go on and get it. Um, this was uh, partially pioneered from the myeloma literature, uh, where. Uh, this approach has been uh, done successfully, particularly in those who are uh, and benef the patients who tend to benefit the most are those who are the most refractory or, or sickest uh, at the start. So, yeah. Oh, sorry. So we'll, we'll talk again. We can keep going. So going through the paper, this is a a, a phase two study. Uh, done between the Dana-Farber Cancer Center and Mass Gen Massachusetts General Hospital Cancer Center. Uh, it's a single treatment regimen. Uh, patients were enrolled between, enrolled between uh, October 2010 and June 2013. The primary endpoint of the study was donor stem cell engraftment, um, peripheral blood, as assessed by peripheral blood, all cell chimerism before measurement. Uh, at day 100, plus 100 after the reduced intensity allo. Uh, secondary endpoints included non relapse mortality uh, at one day 100 in one year, uh, two year PFS, two year OS overall survival, and incidences of acute and chronic GVHD. Uh, the eligibility, so they uh, broke it down into six disease groups. The, the biggest group was uh, diffuse large B cell and transformed low grade uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma who had residual disease after anthracycline chemo, uh, progressive disease after two cycles of anthracycline chemo, 
or disease relapse within 12 months after their anthracycline containing chemo. Um, indolent B cell non Hodgkin lymphoma refractory to the most recent therapy or relapse within 12 months was the next group. Any uh, uh, peripheral T cell lymphoma, except for cutaneous T cell lymphomas, were allowed. Uh, mantle cell lymphoma, double expressing uh, diffuse large B cell lymphomas, overexpression of meaning overexpression of BCL2 and NIC. And the last group was Hodgkin lymphoma refractory to one standard salvage chemotherapy regimen. Um, patients had to uh, be greater than 18, have an ECOG performance 0 to 2, and adequate pulmonary, cardiac, renal, and liver function. Uh, the regimen for autologous stem cell transplant, uh, stem cells could be mobilized by any uh, uh, GCSF containing form and had to uh, get at least 2 times 10 to the 6 CD34 positive cells per kilogram. The conditioning regimen consisted of busulfan, etoposide, and cytoxin. Um, there was pretty standard infectious prophylaxis and uh, all patients were hospitalized during the admission until engraftment. Uh, as far as the reduced intensity uh, protocol, uh, patients were allowed to proceed to the reduced intensity uh, protocol 40 to 180 days after their auto. Um, in that time, they were restaged with a, a CT and preferably PET scan, and also had repeat eligibility studies performed. Um, patients who developed progressive disease were taken off of the trial. Um, as far as donors were concerned, uh, all donors had to be full matched at eight, 8 out of 8 with HLA A, B, C, and DRB1. It can be related or unrelated. Um, they were mobilized by G the donors were mobilized by GCSF. Um, the reduced intensity conditioning consisted of busulfan and fludarabine, and uh, GVHD prophylaxis was tacrolimus and serolimus, um, and methotrexate on days one, three, and six. Um, next slide. Uh, so, going through the statistics and kind of design of the trial, a tandem approach was, cons the authors felt that a tandem approach could be considered feasible if greater than 65% of the patients who completed the auto SCT were able to proceed to the uh, ALO. Um, they predicted, they expected they could enroll about 40 patients and predicted that about 15 of these patients would not be able to proceed to the ALO. Uh, due to either patient choice, lack of uh, suitable donor, or progressive disease, which should not affect the feasibility, they felt should not affect the feasibility. So they predicted that 25 patients could proceed to the transplant, and their goal was to see that if, for, if they could get at least 14 of these 25 onto the trial, then that would be considered feasible. Um, they did throw in an early stopping rule as well. Uh, if greater than or three or more cases of non-relapse mortality had occurred by day 100 in their first 10 patients, they would uh, terminate the study for safety reasons. So the results of the study, uh, sorry, the table one here is not very large, but um, uh, they enrolled 42 patients who underwent the auto stem cell transplant. The median age was 56.5 years. Uh, 41 of the 42 patients were non-Hodgkin lymphoma with one Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, the breakdown is uh, on table one on the right on the left here. Um, the media patients had received a median of two prior lines of therapy. Um, all patients who received the auto and grafted successfully, and there was no non-relapse mortality uh, after the auto with a median follow-up of 30 months. Um, 13 patients ended up dropping out of the trial, uh, not going on to the ALO. Uh, six of the patients because of disease progression, four patients uh, due to their choice, uh, two patients had a lack of a suitable donor, and one patient developed a therapy-related AML. Uh, so moving on to the reduced intensity ALO portion, uh, 29 patients uh, went on to the ALO, 23 of the patients were in CR and 6 were in PR uh, at the start of the 
uh, ALO. Uh, 16 of their uh, patients had related donors, and 13 had uh, matched unrelated donors. Um, the median time from auto to ALO was about 96 days. Uh, all patients engrafted, and of the 17 patients who experienced an ADER, uh, the median uh, was uh, 12 days to neutrophil engraftment and then 13 days to platelet engraftment. Um, day plus 100, uh, median peripheral blood, also donor chimerism was 95%. And uh, day plus 100, median peripheral blood T cell chimerism was 80%. Uh, in the relapses, about, there were five total relapses, all uh, were with, after, after the yellow, all all of the relapses were in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, three of whom were transformed from an indolent non-Hodgkin. And uh, all of those patients who relapsed were in the partial response before the auto. Um, of these five, four did not achieve a CR after the auto and uh, were in a PR before the, the ALO as well. Um, four of these five relapses to, received uh, donor lymphocyte infusion as salvage and were actually able to achieve CR after that. Um, no patient died from causes related to their underlying disease uh, and there was no uh, pre-day 100 non-relapse mortality. Um, looking at the outcomes in terms of non-relapse mortality by two years uh, and incidence of relapse by two years, um, what we see is that uh, there's an 11.1% non-relapse mortality and the, a 17.2% uh, incidence of relapse at two years, which was those five patients I mentioned. The uh, overall two-year PFS and uh, overall survival were 72% and 89% uh, respectively. And this is just the Kaplan-Meier curves of uh, uh, survival. Um, looking at auto alone, those patients who just received auto, the two-year PFS was only 46 percent and the two-year overall survival was 69 percent. Um, there were three deaths after the ALO and the, um, uh, the causes of those deaths were uh, sepsis, bronchiolitis obliterans, and a uh, pneumocystis uh, pneumonia and respiratory failure. Looking at the subset of patients who had uh, double expressing diffuse large B cell lymphoma, there were nine patients, five of whom had uh, uh, MYC and BCL2 translocations. Three had extra copies of MYC with a BCL2 translocation, and one had overexpression of both BCL2 and MYC by IHC. Seven of the uh, uh, nine patients were able to undergo the auto allo tandem and uh, two underwent just the auto alone. Um, there was no disease relapse, which is encouraging in this difficult to treat subset of patients. And uh, one, one patient died from non-relapse causes. Uh, so this is looking at, this is looking at a seri the series of uh, studies uh, of uh, pretty much all studies in lymphoma that have uh, used an auto uh, reduced intensity allo uh, stem cell transplant. Um, and what we can see from this is that uh, with, with the study we just reviewed at the very bottom here, uh, what we can see from this is that uh, initial efforts at, at this were uh, uh, kind of fraught with uh, difficulty, uh, particularly the Gutman trial in the second had a high non-relapse mortality at 43 percent with a very short uh, PFS and OS of only 157 days. Uh, progression-free survival and only a median overall survival of uh, a little over a year. Um, we can see that, that these have improved markedly uh, if you look at uh, uh, the Cohen et al. study uh, looking at uh, follicular non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and which can even included some transformed folliculars. Um, there was very low uh, for uh, non-relapse mortality and very high progression-free survival and overall survival with a follow-up of 39 months. Um, so, so with with this kind with this whole series, we see about 200 patients who have uh, undergone this uh, tandem auto allo, although with different 
regimens and different uh, uh, different diseases uh, contained in each. So it's it's difficult to say with certainty what what this all means. Um, so concluding the review of the study, uh, the primary endpoint of engraftment was met, and uh, it certainly seemed like a feasible feasible operation. Um, the majority of the patients who were uh, eligible went through. Um, the non-relapse mortality, w I would call it acceptable at 11 percent, um, which is compares pretty favorably with historical uh, comparisons. Um, the five relapses uh, uh, in the 29 patients who underwent the tandem uh, lining up to about 17 percent, which is pretty good for a very re refractory group of patients. Um, so I, I would conclude that this, as a proof of principle study, it appears successful. Um, the obvious weaknesses are uh, that it's limited by the uh, size as a phase two trial and the single arm design, so we don't aren't able to comment on efficacy. Um, I would say that the heterogeneity of diseases also makes it difficult to draw strong conclusions, the, although the majority of the patients appeared to be uh, uh, diffuse large or uh, transform uh, lymphomas. Um, I wonder if uh, 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 providing a haploidentical uh, uh, donor or cord blood donor would be uh, um, providing for a little more power to the study for those two patients who uh, uh, weren't able to find a suitable donor. Um, and uh, obviously the approach and no approach yet has figured this out is how to solve the uh, early refractory uh, progressive disease patients. All right, let's see. Let me um, go back to our, let's see. Uh, going back to not screen sharing yet. Not quite yet. But um, while we're going back to, let's see, here we go. Here, uh, Eric is uh, Jacobson has joined us uh, from his very regal uh, <laughs> <laughs> drawing room, uh, and it's, it's uh, one of those props that they use in the news, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you'll you'll have to look at uh, Ray Comenzo's uh, the background <laughs> behind him uh, for for what 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 uh, what maybe when you should clean <laughs> not do it in your bedroom. Let's just say that. <laughs> uh, you are, so, uh, Dr. Jacobson is uh, a sorry senior uh, senior physician and clinical director of the Adult Lymphoma Service at Dana Farber, uh, and was the uh, senior author of the study that we just uh, discussed. And so, thanks very much for joining us, and thank you mostly for the patience in repeatedly trying to log on. Uh, I really uh, appreciate you sticking with us. Yeah, my 12-year-old is out at a school function, so yeah, it was uh, up to my own devices to try to figure out the technology. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. So, um, I guess any comments to start with? Or we we have a few uh, some questions. We're also joined. The two uh, faces in the bottom left right-hand corner are two fellows uh, joining us from Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, <laughs> oh, and uh, so, any. Anything you'd like to start with, or we can just jump on in to some questions. Yeah, well, I would, the only thing I'd add is, you know, originally this trial actually was conceived probably back in 2006, 2007. Um, and we had thought about actually doing tandem, auto, reduced intensity, allo, but doing a T cell depleted reduced intensity allo with a delayed T cell add back. You know, somewhere around 100, 180 days after the Rick Allo. The thought being maybe we could further uh, diminish graft versus host disease by introducing the bulk of the T cells at a time when all the host uh, inflammatory response to conditioning had, had died down. For a number of reasons, uh, predominantly related to funding, the uh, T cell depletion and delayed T cell add back never really panned out. So, an even 10 Finch Fellowship sort of championed this is just a straight auto reduced intensity uh, allo protocol. So, this speaks to some of the difficulties, I think, in getting these trials done. 
um, in the years in which we first thought about it, in the years in which we conducted the trial and, and then analyzed the results, you know, as often happens in medicine, the technology has sort of moved along, and I can see from your slide that you're going to address some of the issues that uh, we also mentioned in the discussion of the paper, and that, you know, unfortunately, at least in some of these populations, Although on proof of principle, this looks pretty good. It may be becoming increasingly obsolete. But uh, I won't bury your lead if you're planning to discuss that. We can kind of go through each of the issues one by one. All right, shall I, do you want to I bring them back up again? Or? Yeah. OK. Let's see if this works again. Took a moment to make it work the first time. We did. We hid that. All right. It took just a minute to share. All right. Yeah, well, let's. I'm going to skip this. That didn't seem to want to work. Oh, all right. We're stuck with it. It's okay. Yeah, one question I, I had for you, Dr. Jacobson, is uh, um, I know there's a lot of variance, not in this trial, this wasn't an issue in this trial, obviously, but uh, with uh, conditioning regimens for reduced intensity LOs, we do something very different at Tufts than uh, uh, is done, was done in this trial. Uh, how much do you think that would have, it, do you think that would affect um, uh, the non-relapse mortality or treatment-related mortality, and, and um, uh, I kind of wonder if this could be broadly generalizable, especially going forward. Yeah, you know, even uh, and again, I'm actually predominantly a lymphoma doc, so um, I can speak a little bit to the conditioning regimens, but my expertise is more in the lymphomas themselves. But okay. um, and you know, for instance, in follicular lymphoma, we kind of moved more towards a radioimmunotherapy-based conditioning regimen. Um, one of our fellows published a couple of years ago uh, a paper, actually in BBMT, looking at the outcomes of both regular follicular lymphoma and transformed follicular lymphoma using a Zevlin-based conditioning regimen that actually looked quite good. So, you know, in a significant percentage of these patients that were on this trial, we probably would no longer use the conditioning regimen that we used as part of this trial. Um, you know, that being said, the reduced intensity conditioning regimen that was used is one that's been used at our facility for quite some time and has been used at, um, at Mass General as well. So really we selected it based on what we've been doing as a standard approach at that time. Yeah. I will say the uh, Conditioning regimen that we use for the auto is something that we no longer use. Um, there was an analysis from the CIBMTR suggesting that beam, at least when you do straight autologous transplant, suggested that beam resulted both in less toxicity and superior outcomes. So a few years ago, we switched from okay. CBV to beam. Uh, the BUSI E regimen that was used in this trial was the regimen that was commonly used at Mass General at that time, which is why it was selected, but they too have switched to BEAM. So uh, there have been some changes both in the auto conditioning regimen and in the allo conditioning regimen since this trial was written. Did you happen to see the, uh, the so at ASBMT, uh, Canadian group using sort of getting back all of the Canadian CIBMTR data, so it was sort of a Canadian focused CIBMTR data. Uh, apparently, in Canada, it's very region specific. It's not, I guess, surprising what conditioning regimens are used. Where um, in sort of Eastern Canada, it's uh, a Melphalan 200 regimen, and to the uh, to the west, or uh, paraphrasing, but it was uh, basically a Melphalan atopicide regimen and somewhere else it was beam and they were actually had sufficient numbers to compare and they actually found no difference uh, but they, this the study had been prompted because the price of the carmustine for them had gone up to uh, some something like 500 fold uh, and so they started looking for alternatives there yeah I mean getting the cost actually cynically the, the other reason for this conditioning regimen at least the auto regimen was the 
Uh, Atsuka, which manufactured uh, busulfan, was willing to fund the trial. So, um, in all honesty, that's part of the reason for selecting a busulfan-based regimen. At least, you know, at that time, there was really no data to suggest that one regimen was superior to the other. So, it certainly maintained equipoise and provided funding to get the, uh, the study done. But, um, you know, at, at least. In lymphomas, I think the, the, still the broadest experience, experience internationally is with me. And, you know, anecdotally, since we've made the switch, we haven't formally examined our own internal outcomes, but I think just observationally, uh, it seems to be a better tolerated regimen, at least than CBB, which we used before. It doesn't seem to be as much mucositis. Patients seem to get out of the hospital a little bit more quickly. Um, I'm not sure in the long run if that would have made much difference, you know, whether changing the auto regimen or changing the, uh, the reduced intensity conditioning would have made much difference in the outcome. Okay. Um, I know you, you touched on this a little bit in your discussion, but uh, um, what, what subtypes of lymphoma do you uh, imagine this approach would be most useful for going into the future if you were to try and design a, a large phase three trial with it? Yeah, I think if you look at the types that we included, um, you know, the field has moved on pretty substantially. So, you know, there's only one patient with Hodgkin's lymphoma, but if you look at the eligibility criteria for the patients with Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, those are folks who really would have met the criteria for the Athera trial of post-transplant brentuximab, um, where outcomes now look quite good, and then also with the advent of uh, checkpoint inhibitors and a number of trials, including one that Philippe Armand here is doing, looking at post-transplant consolidation with uh, PD-1 inhibitors. I think, you know, as that field has evolved, the need for this in Hodgkin's lymphoma has probably, was already low and has probably gone down even mm -hmm. further. Um, if you look at mantle cell lymphoma, again, with the advent of you know, not only Ibrutinib, but now some newer BTK inhibitors in development. The favorable data with um, venetoclax, which will probably be approved in CLL this year and eventually approved in mantle cell lymphoma. Um, some of the bispecific antibodies that are in development. I think that the therapeutic pipeline for mantle cell lymphoma is so robust in the outcomes now uh, with cytarabine-based therapy and just the straight autotransplant are so good that this also now is probably not applicable to a huge population of mantle cell lymphoma patients. The one exception may be blastoid mantle cell, uh, you know, which tends to be chemo-refractory, uh, tends not to do well with just an autotransplant, and may not be as responsive to some of the new agents as non-blastoid mantle cell. But again, that's a, a select population. And then um, within large cell lymphoma and, and transformed follicular lymphoma, you know, really the population we addressed in this trial is probably a population that in the very near future is you know, assuming one of these CAR T cell uh, platforms gets approved, would probably be a population that would be shunted more towards CAR T cells, where, you know, at least in the early data, the one and two year progression free survival with CAR T cells looks fairly comparable to what we saw in our study, um, and arguably with less toxicity. Um, so, to me, if you look at, at where lymphoma stands, the, the, the biggest need, I think, is still in T-cell lymphomas. Uh, there's still not convincing data that autologous transplant alters natural history. We do it, uh, but obviously there's no randomized data, as you showed at the beginning of your presentation. Um, historically, ablative allogeneic transplant has had a very high transplant-related mortality in that population. And although there have been some drugs approved, their efficacy is nowhere near the efficacy of drugs that have been approved in mantle cell lymphoma or Hodgkin's lymphoma. So uh, probably within T-cell lymphomas right now is where this approach would be most enticing to me. Do you see any biomarkers or disease factors that you would anticipate uh, in predicting who would benefit from the uh, tandem approach, or, or uh, have you had to guess or, or 
uh, make a bet on it, what would you say? Yeah, I think the you know the best marker we probably have is a metabolic marker. That's um, you know, although we know that patients with, for instance, diffuse large B cell lymphoma or Hodgkin's lymphoma who have early recurrences or a primary refractory disease. Uh, in general, don't do as well with autotransplant. If you achieve a metabolic CR going into the transplant, you seem to do as well as, as somebody who had a later recurrence. So, if I was going to select out a population, it would be you know folks who had had less than a complete remission going into the autotransplant, where a, a GBL effect may be particularly beneficial. Um, I you know as you alluded to, I thought the results were. Pretty encouraging in, in double hit lymphomas. You know, yeah, sort of a, it's a parsing of terms, but we included double expressing lymphomas that are MYC and BCL2 positive without the translocations. Yeah. Some data that's emerged since this publication have suggested, or since this study, have suggested that maybe the, the outcome of those folks isn't as bad as we thought it was, uh, but still the outcome of people who have the dual translocation is poor. Um, so again, short of CAR T cells, that would be another population I think that would be reasonable to consider. And then fairly encouraging that despite a relatively high relapse rate after the ALO, everyone went back into remission and has remained in remission with donor lymphocyte infusion, which was a bit of a surprise. Um, you know, and unfortunately, given the small size and heterogeneous patient population, we weren't really able to look at any biomarkers of response. Um, and you know, to my knowledge, in, in allo transplant and these diseases, there hasn't really been an emergence of strong biomarkers to predict who's going to benefit from allo. Uh, so mostly, I would, you know, for now, guide it upon clinical factors. Okay. All right. Well, I think sort of got through all of my questions <laughs> <laughs> at the same time. Uh, yeah, written the rejection. No, I, think I, I was quite uh, surprised by the response you saw to the donor lymphocyte infusions. In that, uh, you know, it's a strong. We take that as a strong statement of allo reactivity or the the uh, the ability of the immune system to see those tumors. And I I, I suggest I, I think you're sort of on the right track too, thinking that maybe. You know, a checkpoint inhibitor will be able to achieve some of that same effect without uh, the, the, the downside risk of graft versus host disease. Right. So, of the several like um, immune therapies that are being tried in non Hodgkin lymphoma, which ones do you think would have the most success by mimicking the DLI effect? Yeah, the, you know, the out, if you look at Checkpoint inhibitors as standalone agents in the therapy of relapsed and refractory aggressive non Hodgkin's lymphomas. The, the results haven't been terrible, but they certainly haven't been as good as what we've seen in Hodgkin's lymphoma, where clearly these agents are incredibly active and, and produce durable responses. So, as standalone agents, for the most part, they have response rates you know, under 40%, often closer to 30%. At the moment, uh, there's really nothing that clinically or biologically that differentiates these agents um, amongst one another to suggest that one would be superior in aggressive lymphoma compared to another. Um, you know, there was a trial in the, in the journal of Clinical Oncology uh, maybe about two years or so ago now that looked at post-transplant pitalizumab um, in patients undergoing autotransplant for large cell lymphoma. And, you know, a fair percentage of patients who had residual FDG uh, avid abnormalities post-transplant converted to metabolic CRs, uh, and even those who were CR going into transplant and, and prior to checkpoint inhibitors um, had a longer progression-free survival than what you would expect from historical controls. Again, it was a non-randomized trial, more of a proof of principle trial like this current study, but at least showed that the approach was feasible didn't induce excessive toxicity and at least compared to historical controls resulted in better outcomes than you would expect. Uh, Pitalizumab for you know, reasons that are not entirely clear, I think partly because of marketing and the part of the manufacturer has not been aggressively carried forward in new malignancy. Uh, so the ones we're working with right now are predominantly nemolumab and, and pembrolizumab. And, um, in all honesty, which one we've used has largely been dependent on the availability of 
uh, pharmaceutical sponsored trials or a willingness of, of a sponsor to fund an IST rather than any data that's one is superior to the other. Mark Schiff uh, in the lab here has done a lot of work on checkpoint inhibitors. And, um, you know, as far as she's been able to tell, at least in her models, there isn't a clear differentiator amongst them. I mean, the safety profile of, of let's say, CARs versus DARTs and, and immune checkpoint antibodies, uh, the most favorable seems to be the immune checkpoint antibodies comparatively. Yeah. And I think in the post, like, let's say, transplant setting, it might be the most well tolerated as well. I, yeah, I agree. Well, I think, you know, I guess it depends which type of, of transplant you could do. You know, you could certainly look at this type of approach, do an auto transplant for debulking followed by CAR T cells, so supplant the RIC aloe with the CAR T cell infusion. Um, and again, maybe to mitigate some of the toxicity of CAR T cells, maybe the cytokine release syndrome would be a little bit less if you did this after, or, or choose those after an auto. Um, if you look at post aloe, um, you know, we did have a study of post allo um, uh, ipilimumab in patients with CLL that Matt Davids uh, did and has presented in abstract form and is submitted for publication. Um, and at least, you know, in a relatively small series of patients didn't seem to induce an undue amount of, of toxicity. So I think for patients who respond to sal respond well to salvage and go on to an auto, um, maybe it makes sense to do checkpoint inhibitors. You're only mopping up minimal residual disease. They're very generally fairly well tolerated. For patients with more high risk disease, you know, either go straight to a CAR T cell and skip the auto, or use the CAR or use the auto as further debulking before CAR T cells. Um, those would be probably the two major approaches that I would see going forward. I, I kind of see the number of allo transplants that we do for lymphoma slowly diminishing in the years ahead. Poor Gunjan. Um, <laughs> sort of on that vein, um, you know, it seems like part of the work with the trial that it took a long time and some of the to create and sort of enroll to and, and report, and so many other therapies came out in the middle. Um, are there plans that you guys are doing now that are sort of the next step from this trial or um, with either a maintenance option or something else or is it mostly that you're focusing on other areas of research and transplant with lymphoma? Yeah, we don't, uh, right now we don't have any further tandem transplant protocols, which I guess you know, we vote with our feet uh, or vote with the studies that we write. So the fact that we haven't written up a follow-up study, I guess, you know, Tells you what we think. Um, so right now, most of our lymphoma studies um, in transplant have involved post-transplant immunotherapies, uh, predominantly checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, in, in conjunction with City of Hope, we're going to have a post-transplant brentuximab study um, and other CD30 expressing lymphomas aside from Hodgkin's lymphoma. So to see if we can build upon the experience from the Athera trial um, and other CD30 positive lymphomas. Uh, and then also some vaccine trials. Um, previously we had a, a KM562 based vaccine platform and now probably moving, or not probably, are moving to a neoantigen vaccine. So looking at you know various non-functional but immunogenic, immunogenic proteins in the lymphoma and, and generating an immune response that way either as a standalone approach or in combination with checkpoint inhibitors. So you know, most of our research bent in lymphoma has, has moved away from the allo transplant part of it and looking at other ways of inducing an immune response either without the auto or after the auto. All right. The hour is uh, just about up. Uh, any, any, anything more there from from New York? Nope. <laughs> yes, no. Well, it's Saturday night. <laughs> We're gonna put Gunjan out of business. Night is young. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much for joining us and uh, for uh, tolerating uh, the, the 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 connection issues over the last few days. 
I really appreciate you taking the time. No problem. Thank you for dropping off the camera this morning. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> I was just lucky I ran in, into Jen Brown as she was That's walking. What she said. <laughs> He said, I saw Andreas I don't know. I was like <laughs> rattling the door for, for <laughs> hours. Before. So, well, thank you very much again, and uh, have a great night. And, uh, All right, you too. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.